I'm going to have you turn with me to Romans 13, please. Romans chapter 13. While you're turning there, how many of you have ever heard of the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow? Yeah? yeah? About everyone. Well, if you've heard of him, you've all heard of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. Oh, yeah. Because he is the poet that uh, wrote that poem. But how many have ever heard of Israel Bissell? Israel Bissell. You ever heard of him? Well, believe it or not, Israel Bissell was a humble post rider on the Boston-New <coughs> York route. And after the Battle of Lexington and Concord on April 19, 1775, Bissell was ordered to raise the alarm in New Haven, Connecticut. Well, he reached Worcester, Massachusetts, which is normally a day's ride in two hours. When he got there, his horse promptly dropped dead. He paused only long enough to get another horse, and then Bissell, he pressed on, and by April the 22nd, uh, he was in New Haven. But he didn't stop there. He rode on to New York City and, ar and arrived in New York on April the 24th and still stayed in the saddle until he reached Philadelphia the next day. He traveled 126 hours, 345 miles on horseback, and he did so to signal the American militia units throughout the Northeast that the British were coming. It's an urgent message. The British are coming. Well, the last couple of weeks, I've been trying to <clears throat> urgently rouse your attention and alarm you and awaken you to the fact that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And so, as a result, I thought that we would turn here to Romans chapter 13 because as I said this afternoon, or rather this morning in the message, we as believers have an important appointment that we have to keep. You have an extremely important appointment, and it's this. God hath not appointed you to wrath, but he has appointed you to receive salvation. <clears throat> By that, in the context, we said, that appointment is not to the day of the Lord, or what we would call the tribulation, but rather to salvation, which in the context is the rapture. Of the church. You know, if you have an extremely important appointment ahead of you, perhaps it's in the morning, before you go to bed at night, you set an alarm so that uh, you won't miss your appointment. Well, what I see in Romans 13, beginning in verse 11 down through verse 14, is really an alarm. And it is an alarm telling us that time is running out. It's an alarm to wake us up. It's an alarm to tell us we have to wake up, we have to clean up, and we have to dress up. Because Jesus is coming. And so that's what I want to share with you after we pause just a moment here and pray. Romans 13 verses 11 to 14. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that we can once again open your word together. And I pray that this will be a good time of not only studying your word, but then also uh, good feedback and, and, uh, and thought-provoking uh, questions and answers that would cause us to really be awakened to the fact that time is running out. We see it all around us. There's evidence of it. Lord, spiritually awaken us today, we pray. Grant a spiritual awakening first in your church and then in our community, through our lives, through awakened believers, 
we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So turn to chapter 13 of Romans. Look at verse 11 with me, and notice how he starts. And that knowing the time, that it is high time, in other words, time is running out, to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. So the call in verse 11 is very clear, an alarm to wake up. And it's an alarm to wake up because remember what we said this morning? If you are a believer, you are a child of the day. You are children of the light. By the way, Whoever that group was where they found the scrolls in the Dead Sea, the Qumran scrolls, one of, the, one of the characteristics of those scrolls is they saw themselves as the sons of light. They saw themselves as children of light. And they saw people that, uh, that weren't following the scriptures as children of darkness. They called themselves the sons of light, and they realized that they were locked in a battle with the sons of darkness, with the children of darkness. Since we are the sons of light, the children of the day, we should not be living as if we belong to the darkness. You know, it's very interesting, isn't it, that human nature... At least it used to be this way. It's not so much this way. It used to be that sin was shameful. And so people would carry out their sin under the darkness or the cover of night. These last days that we're living in is really a spiritual night. We're living in a spiritual, moral, and, uh, a moral and spiritual night time. Currently, and here Christians are warned in this 11th verse. See it? They're warned that the day is at hand. Now is our salvation nearer or approaching? Our salvation is a deliverance that, in the context, is referring to the culmination of our salvation. By that, I mean. When Jesus returns for his people, when Jesus referred, returns for his church, our salvation will be completed. Our salvation will be culminated. Remember, there are three tenses of salvation. There's a past tense, I was saved. There's a present tense, I'm being saved. There's a future tense, I shall be saved. I will be saved. Well, that future tense hasn't happened yet. But when Jesus returns, it will happen, and that's what he's talking about. It's the culmination of our of that future tense of our salvation that will take place when Jesus returns for his church. And what we are to learn from this is that that day of Jesus' return is getting nearer. It's approaching nearer and nearer every day. And that means just what we've been talking about, that the rapture, the catching up of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is an imminent event, is an event that can happen any time, any day, and any moment of the day. And so we need to wake up, is what he's saying in that 11th verse. Awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation, the culmination of it, nearer than when we believe the day of Jesus' return has, is approaching nearer and nearer than ever before. And so we need to be ready. The light is about to dawn, is what he's saying. So we have to be ready. It's time to wake up, is what verse 11 is saying. He's trying to stir us up from any apathy, any lethargy, any insensitivity to sin, any fascination with uh, or fantasizing of worldly dreams. He's trying to wake us up from living for ourselves. Wake up. Stop living for yourself. 
Stop living for what you can get out of life. Wake up. Because Jesus is about to appear. And he is nearer than he's ever been before to coming back for us. So wake up. Stop living for what you can get. Stop living for uh, possessions, for wealth. Stop living for any fame that you might grasp hold of, any popularity you might have. Stop living for uh, position or power that you might latch on to. Stop living for yourself for selfish reasons. Wake up. That's verse 11. Verses 12 and 13, clean up. What do you mean? Verse 12 says, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. What day do you think he's talking about? He's talking about the dawning of the culmination of our salvation, the appearance of Jesus. Because the night is almost over and the day of Jesus' appearing is about to break forth, he says, verse 12, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Now the works of darkness are the same thing that Paul calls in Galatians 5, uh, 20 and 21, the works of the flesh. The works of darkness are the same thing as the works of of the flesh. Get rid of them. Cast them off, the works of darkness, and in its place, put on the armor of light. Darkness, light. Get rid of the darkness, put on the light. Let us, verse 13, walk honestly as in the day. Remember I said it's human nature to want to cover your sin and do it under the, the cover of darkness at night. He says, Let's walk honestly. Let's walk transparently. Let, let's, uh, let's walk openly as in the day, not try to cover up. So verses 12 and 13 follows verse 11, wake up, it's clean up, which is simply this. Since the rapture is imminent. Now what does imminent mean? Any moment. Any moment. Any moment. Since the rapture is imminent, you don't want to be found dressed in dirty spiritual clothing. Here's how John says it in his uh, first epistle. He says, And now, little children, abide in him, abide in Jesus, that when he shall appear, which could be at any moment, when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Don't be caught in dirty spiritual clothing. Don't be caught in dirty moral clothing. Because, remember how he says it? He says, we are now the children of God, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. You don't want to be caught in dirty clothing. And I'm talking about spiritual and moral clothing. You don't want to be dressed in dirty clothing. So he says in that 12th verse, cast off the works of darkness. That's the dirty clothing. Throw away those dirty rags of darkness, the works of the flesh, the works of darkness, which are sinful deeds that he's going to actually... Uh, give a list of them in verse 13 in just a moment. But he says, cast them off. Cast off. And it is interesting that that verb, cast off, is in a, a tense that means that you put them off once and for all. In fact, the word cast off in verse 12 is the word that we get our English word endo from. Endo, which means to, uh, to, to, to put on, uh, to be clothed with, if you will. And so he says, get rid of those 
and instead clothe yourselves with the armor of, of right living. That's what he means by the armor of light, right living, that you might be adequately protected. In fact, the armor of light, which is right living, is the only way that you can adequately be protected in these last days, these evil days before Jesus returns for us. And he defines for us in the next verse precisely what the armor of light is and how to put it on, how to clean up. I should say this. These works of darkness, the works of the flesh, you know what the flesh is, right? The flesh, it, in, in its simplest form, is your body. Your body, your flesh, is the turf through which indwelling sin plays out in your daily life. Put off the works of the flesh. Don't allow your body and the parts of your body to be the turf through which indwelling sin is lived out in your daily life. So put on the armor of light. Your body is special. Your body is special. You know, the human body is a, is a miracle, is it not? I mean, you don't have to be a medical doctor. You don't have to be a biologist in order to realize that the human body is phenomenal. And, God, and it is so because God has created this. God has given us these human bodies. These human bodies are given to us by God. Ultimately, they belong to him because he made them. He gave them to us, but he made them. And not only that, if you are a believer, we are told in the scripture that our bodies that have been used for sinful and selfish things and choices... Jesus has bought them back. Jesus has purchased them, repurchased them out of uh, slavery to sin. And so our bodies don't belong to us. If you're a believer, mark it down and never forget this. Your body is not yours. It's not your body to do with it what you please, what you want. We're told over and over again in the world and, and, uh, and through just worldly philosophy that, uh, for instance, a woman's body is hers. Your body is not yours. Your body belongs to God. Whether you be male or female, and there's only two, your body belongs to God, not to you. And if you're a believer, it's your body is doubly his. For he made it, and then he redeemed it. So your body belongs to God. Don't allow your body that belongs to God to be used as the vehicle through which the works of darkness or the works of the flesh can be played out in your life. And that's why young people, are you listening to me? That's why the Bible says, not just to young people, but to all of us, but I did it when I was a young person, and I hope you will too, so that it will be true when you're an older person as well. And that is this, I beg you. I beseech you with Paul that you present, that you offer as a living sacrifice your body to God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice to God. And you know what? That's the reasonable service. That's the, that's the most reasonable thing that you can do. That's an act of worship when you present your body, young people, in surrender fully to God. Have you done that? Would you say that to God in, in your heart of hearts? Would you say, God, I want you to have all of me. I present my body and all that that represents. I present my body to you, both the outward me and the inward me. My whole self, I surrender. If you haven't done that, do that. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Do it today because the works of darkness will sink into your life, and they will eat you alive. They'll chew you up. They'll ruin your life here on this earth. Surrender your bodies and your lives to the Lord. That's the, really the first step, you might say, to this cleaning up effort. Notice the areas 
of the works of darkness. Are you with me? I haven't put you to sleep yet, have I? I haven't heard any snoring. <laughs> but I have my doubts. <laughs> Here's the thing. The works of darkness, remember I said, and the works of the flesh are the same thing? Look at the works of, of darkness that he mentions in verse 13. And there is a real parallel between that and the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, 20 and 21. We're just going to tick through them quickly. These are just some, not all, of the following the following areas of the works of darkness, of the works of the flesh. He says, first of all, walk openly, walk honestly, walk transparently, not hypocritically, as in the day, in the open, in the light. Don't put on airs. Be real. And then do not walk in rioting. Okay, what's that? Is that what we see on television when people are going, uh, you know, breaking windows and starting fires? And No. The word rioting there is the same word that in Galatians 5.21 is called revelings. Rioting and reveling. What is it? It is nighttime, loud, wild drinking parties. That's what it is. That's what rioting means. That's what to revelate means. I see these bars and they advertise on their uh, on their signs, happy hour. <coughs> right? These bars, these clubs, they have a happy hour. It's not happy. It's a fake happy. It's not real happy. It's it, it's to set you up for rioting and reveling. Carousing is what it means. It's it's uh, the nightlife that you see in Manhattan or in Brooklyn or anywhere. The nightlife where you, you go to bars and clubs. That's rioting. That's reveling. That's carousing. That's the, the, the nighttime, loud, wild drinking parties. That's what rioting is. Stay away from it. Stay out of it. Don't set yourself up for the works of darkness. You're to put that off. You're a child of the light. You're a child of the light. You have no business in, in the works of darkness. Rioting. What's the next word there in verse 13? Drunkenness. Well, that's pretty obvious, yeah. Actually, the word for drunkenness there is... Uh, from the word, the root word for strong drink or intoxicated uh, drink. And drunkenness refers to a habitual intoxication that, by the way, is the result of partying. See how they go together? They, they really are tied together here. And that is also mentioned as the works of the flesh in Galatians 5.21. Drunkenness is a work of the flesh and it's a work of darkness. What's the next one? The next one is chambering. Now, that might be a little uh, puzzling to us. We don't use this word. The word is coite. Have you ever heard of coitus? Coite. It's the word translated bed in uh, our Bibles. Chambering is bedding down. It's talking about... Uh, Sexual intercourse, talking about sexual promiscuity. And by the way, that's why people go to bars and clubs, to pick up women or to pick up men, so that they can uh, uh, carry out this, uh, the King James uses such a euphemism, chain, chain word, right? That's what they go for, so that they can hook up with someone for a one-night stand at drinking parties. You know why? Because alcohol removes the inhibitions, just like drugs do, right? You use alcohol and drugs, so you remove your inhibitions, so you're easy prey then. So try to get them a little, get them a little high or feeling a little good, so then their inhibitions are down, so they're easier prey for you to prey upon. That's the works of darkness. That's what you want to stay away from. 
What else? Wantonness. Again, that's a word that we don't we don't use, but I want you to understand it. Wantonness is just it's filthy, unrestrained, uncontrolled lust. That's what wantonness is. In Galatians 5:19. It's called lasciviousness, one of the works of the flesh. It's just uncontrolled lust. Just doing what you feel like doing. Just considering it a natural drive. And so you, you fulfill your natural desires. It's immoral living that discards all decency. You just let yourself go. Wantonness. And again, that is all connected with drunkenness. And partying. It's all part of the same stuff. Wantonness. It's just living in disregard of all that is right and all that is decent. Who cares? We're just going to live it up. We're just going to do what we feel like doing. That is uncontrolled lust. And then the next word in that 13th verse is the word strife. And again, that might not need much explanation. Uh, it actually means arguing, quarreling, fighting because of rivalries. In Galatians 5.20, the works of the flesh, it's called variance. Barroom brawls, if you will. It goes along with this drinking and partying. You get into fights. If it's not a literal fisticuffs, physical, it's argument. It's quarreling. That's right. That's a work of darkness. That's the works of the flesh. If you have that in your family life, you got a problem. You got the works of darkness really controlling in your home. That's what you don't want that. You don't want that. Put it off, he says. Let us walk honestly. Let us put off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. And then the, the last one in verse 13 of Romans 13 is the word envying. And again, not much is needed to be said about that. We get our word zealous from that word envying. And the root word of that word translated envying means something that you, that you heat up to a boil. To boil with heat. So it's talking, envying, it's like jealousy, but it's fierce jealousy. And the works of the flesh, Galatians 5.20, it's called emulation. It's jealousy. Extreme, fierce jealousy. Envying. And again, it all goes together. Doesn't it? That's what happens. The works of darkness. That's just a little bit of what it means to clean up. Wake up, clean up, <laughs> verses 12 and 13, and then verse 14 is dress up. How do we dress up? Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. He said in uh, verse 12, put on the armor of light. He says in verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Same word, put on that we get our English word in do from. And in that, that uh, aorist tense, it means to put on once and for all. To put on the armor of light. That's a little, that's a little cryptic, right? What does it mean to put on the armor of light? Well, light is referring to right living. Light is right living. But how do you do that? How do you put on right living? Well, very clear in verse 14, he answers the question for us. You put on Christ. To put on Christ is to put on the armor of light. That's who he is. To put on Christ means that you're endued with him. You remember when Jesus was about to ascend back to his father's house? On the Mount of Olives, he said to his disciples, look, I'm going back to heaven. But you guys, you tarry here in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. What's he talking about? He's talking about the Holy Spirit 
that was going to descend upon them on that day of Shavuot or Pentecost and was going to empower them to live and to preach the gospel. Well, guess what? That word in do, you shall be in do with power on, uh, on high, is the same word put on. Put on the armor of light. Be endued with the armor of light. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Be endued. Be clothed with Christ. Be clothed with Christ is what he's saying here. His presence. His presence. Paul says in Galatians 3.27, If you've been baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. And he's not talking about water baptism. He's talking about the fact that when you were saved, the Holy Spirit of God plunged you into, immersed you into Jesus. And when you got immersed into Jesus, when you were baptized or plunged into the person of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ then clothed you with himself. With his presence. He lives in you. He indwells you. He clothes you. He's your spiritual clothing. And so he says, make that fact functional. The presence of Jesus is a fact in you. Make it functional in your daily life. His presence. Remember how he said it in uh, the book of Colossians when we were going through that uh, book just a, what, a couple of months ago, if that, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 10, he says that you have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that hath created him. You put on the new man. That is, you become a partaker of the divine nature. That's the truth about every believer. So tap into that. Let that function. Let the very fact of Christ in you flow through, out through you. How do you do that? By depending upon Christ in you to deliver you from sinful temptations, like our mentioned in verse 13. Depend upon Christ to deliver you from rioting, from drunkenness, from chambering, from wantonness, from strife and envying. Depend upon the Christ that is in you to deliver you from those sinful temptations. To be like Christ by taking by faith all that Jesus is in you for your daily living. Because he's your life. So he says in that 14th verse, don't make provision. For your flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Literally, to think ahead. To not make provision is to think ahead. To see and think ahead. To give forethought to. What he means is this. You, Jesus in you, has the power to demolish the sinful strongholds in your mind that captivate your thinking. He's able to captivate your thinking with things above. And not let yourself daydream thinking about ways that you have in the past or you can in the future indulge your sinful desires, thus feeding them and nourishing yourself on the works of the flesh, on the works of darkness. You ever catch yourself thinking about some of the sinful things that you've done in the past? And I don't want to bring them to your memory by just saying that. But you know what? The devil will bring them to your will bring them clearly to your mind. But you don't have to entertain them. You don't have to go there. If you go there, you're you're making provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And what you need to do is recognize that Jesus in you is enough to deliver you. Even from those wrong thoughts, he can bring those thoughts into his captivity and enable you to think on him and things above instead of yourself and things of this earth. So don't let yourself, your thoughts just drift. Don't let yourself daydream and think about the ways that you have or could indulge your sinful desires because 
that's going to take you down that road of the works of the flesh, the works of darkness. There was a young man who was a very promiscuous young man, and he lived, he lived for quite a few years with a mistress. But he began to come under conviction because he had a godly mother who prayed for him constantly. And he came under such conviction of sin that he, he wanted to be saved. He wanted to be sure that he had God's forgiveness. And one day he was, he was weeping over his spiritual condition as he sat in a garden that a friend owned. And while he was sitting there crying, he heard a child in a nearby yard singing, a song that's with the words, take up and read. Take up and read. So there happened to be a biblical scroll near him, and he picked up that scroll that lay near him, and he began to read. And when he opened it, his eyes fell on Romans chapter 13 and verse 13. Let us walk honestly in the day, not in rioting, drunkenness, chambering, wantonness, in strife and envying. And when he read that, he said at that point, instantly, he says as the sentence ended, it was as if a light flooded into my soul and infused my heart and all the gloom of doubt and sin vanished from me. So, in light of the fact that we haven't been... <clears throat> appointed to wrath, the day of the Lord, but rather to the wonderful hope, the blessed hope of the any moment appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the rapture. How should we then live? We should, first of all, what? Wake up. Secondly, we should clean up. And then lastly, we should what? Dress up. Dress up. 